This is Star Talk, Cosmic Queries Edition. Of course, I got Chuck Nice with me to, to make this happen. Chuck, what's up, Neil? Dude, you know it's not it's not often we get one of my own people. That's right. In a, in a Cosmic Queries. That's right. Just just my 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 kindred spirit. And today we've got Professor Hair Doctor Brian Cox across the pond from the UK. Brian, welcome to Star Talk, dude. Not your first rodeo with us. No, it isn't. No, we've been doing this for a few years now, haven't I? I think yeah, it was about yeah. 10 Plus, years ago. I've been a guest on your, on your show. Yeah. Uh, a couple of times I've been in the UK. I was there live. You got an audience and stuff. So that, that was fun. And so you, let me get your, make sure I get your bio accurately described here. So you're a professor of particle physics, University of Manchester. That sounds very specific. It's not, you're not just professor of physics, right? Yeah. Particle, uh, particle physics. physics. Yeah. I mean, I, I, my, my research history is I worked, I've worked at the particle accelerators around the world, actually, including Fermilab in Chicago, oh, okay. uh, the wow. DAISY in Hamburg and CERN in Geneva. So that's yeah, the big one. Yeah. Okay. And so out of the UK, you've hosted multiple TV shows. Uh, the one I remember most is the universe. And you also did one on the solar system. Correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. Solar yeah. system. And, uh, yeah, and you got another, the, uh, that was the local version of that travel show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the uh, yeah. bit that we the might great, be able to The greater travel it. show was the universe, and you were like, by the way, check out this neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to do and, multiverse next. And you got another one, the, uh, Brian Cox's Adventures in Space and Time. And uh, for me, what's most important is that you have come stateside. You have crossed, you've crossed the ocean to give a multi-city stage theater tour of the universe this is this is bold hairy and audacious i love it i yeah. love it and by the time this posts uh you're in the middle of the tour uh coming up in uh, edmonton in canada edmonton calgary vancouver and then you slip down into seattle portland can't not do them if you're doing canada all right and then sacramento san francisco san jose los angeles two nights in los angeles san diego then you hit up texas and it sounds like a Johnny Cash song. I know, it does. <laughs> I've been everywhere, man. <laughs> <laughs> and you ended in Texas, yeah. in Houston, Texas. So, so good luck with that tour. Oh my gosh, what can people expect? Well, it's um, it's spectacular is the first thing to say. So we use the biggest LED screen that we can fit into the venues. And it was designed actually for the in, in the fall. We're doing these huge shows in the in the UK because I, I always say to you, you know, people know who I am in the UK and it's a bit more a bit more low key in the US. Um, so the, the, the show is designed for 15,000 seat arenas. And so we produce these graphics of flying into black holes, a lot of black holes in there, considering the uh, the nature of life in the universe, origin of life, future of life, the uh, wow. multiverse. So all the, the big questions in space, time, black holes, cosmology. But it's essentially big graphics. And um, hopefully for everybody, I mean, I do do some complicated stuff in the middle about quantum entanglement and the black hole information paradox that we can talk about later. But um, the idea is yeah, that of it's course, a show it wouldn't be a show yeah, exactly. unless you did that. Right, right, right of course. Yeah. Duh. I was talking it out with my uh, eight year old <laughs> last night. <laughs> It's on the tip of everybody's tongue. It is, you know. I was like, sweetie, oh, now just remember, uh, you know, in the morning we'll finish this little conversation on quantum entanglement. In the meantime, <laughs> sleep here, but not here yeah. in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> no. So you, so this is this is not a Brian Cox lecture on stage. This is a performance with a hugely, um, a hugely visually uh, delivered messaging about science and physics and the universe and yeah and, and uh, there's uh, music's a big part of it so it starts with um sibelius's fifth symphony the third movement oh. and uh, almost a version of 2001 that i ended up making because I, I asked a friend of mine who's a conductor as a joke one night you know what should what should stanley kubrick have used Right, and it was kind of a joke, but he immediately said he should have chosen this piece of music by Sibelius, which was written in 1915. And it's at one level, it's about swans taking off from a lake in northern Finland, but at another level, it's about the deep beauty of nature. It's, it's that idea, that famous quote from Einstein, that if you look carefully at nature, you might catch a glimpse of something deeply hidden, which is the structure of nature itself. And so that it, it just sounded like that to me. So I ended up. Um, almost remaking 2001 in eight minutes, which uh, to the horror of my promoter. 
So let me quantify <laughs> pay for it. <laughs> how popular you are in the UK. I have, I have a, a, a way to measure that for you. I don't know if I ever told you this. Okay. So, okay. So right now in the United States, I, I'd be stopped by 15 out of 20 people in the street. Okay. Could they recognize me? Whatever. Okay. I think for you, it's 20 out of 20 it, it, or 21 out of 20 people in, it, in the UK. But let me, I can quantify that. Okay. You are so popular there that no one knows who the hell I am there. So watch what happened. We were filming <laughs> Cosmos. We're in Trafalgar Square, big square. And we're filming Cosmos and we're cordoned off. Okay. And all, and I'm there, you know, delivering lines and things and all manner of people. Hey, that's Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's not, I said, oh, where are you from? Oh, we're from the Netherlands. Oh, we're from India. Oh, we're from Russia. Oh, we're from, <laughs> nobody stopped who was from the UK. <laughs> nobody. So either they're just polite and they don't, or you completely occupy that space. Mm in the UK. And that's what I'm thinking is going on. There. Or Brian does all of his talks in the UK. And instead of ending it with keep looking up, he ends it with don't listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally happy. Okay, just to, to swap for a few months. So I'll you can have the UK. I'll have the US just until the end of this tour. We'll, we'll swap roles. That's good. That's a good deal for me. So now no, no, I don't. Here's the question. I can't Brian. even recite this many cities in the UK that you're going to do here in the United States. This, you know, this feels like a little bit because you got that Beatles haircut. It feels a little bit like the British invasion, you know, putting us in a new place that we didn't even know we could land. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Very cool. So, Chuck, you, you collected questions from our Patreon supporters. Indeed, we do have them. And, uh, yeah. of course, you know, our, our listeners very excited uh, to ask Brian questions. So do you want to jump into this? Yeah, yeah let's, let's go straight ahead. Uh, what do you have? All right, this is uh, Marcus Gustafsson, Gustafsson, who says, hello and greetings from Sweden. If the strength of gravity happened to be a little stronger or a little bit weaker than it is, how different would our universe be? Ooh, mm. it's, a, it's a good question. And it's this is widely debated, actually, because um, there, there's a, a question of how much you can change the the fundamental properties of nature. So do you say the strength of gravity, the mass of the electron, the way the Higgs field works, all those things such that you have a radically different universe. And actually, it's quite hard because you can change some things and then change something else. And it kind of balances the change out. And and so it's quite a controversial area, actually. But Broadly speaking, if gravity were too strong, all else being equal, then things would collapse ultimately into black holes very quickly. So the early universe would not have formed extended structures like galaxies and solar systems, uh, or stars may be very short-lived and, and so on. So you can change you can change the universe such that you would not have life in the universe if you increase the strength of gravity too much. But also you can decrease it too much and then stars and galaxies don't form in the early universe. And again, you probably don't have a living universe. Now, you, you could, the, the complication comes when you say, OK, well, what if in the early universe, the, the slightly over dense regions were a bit denser, which would have something to do with um, a theory we called inflation, possibly, or something that, you know, the way the Big Bang was. And then you turn gravity down a bit. Can you kind of compensate? And it's true, you can. So it becomes an extremely dif difficult modeling challenge. And so you'll see research papers on this. How can you change the things and fine tune things? But then broadly speaking, that's what happens. If it is too strong, then everything collapses into black holes. And if it is too weak, nothing forms at all. Wow. Okay, so that's the, phys that's the physicist answer, OK? Now we'll give you the astrophysicist answer. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> all right. In, in graduate astrophysics 101, OK? One of the first calculations we do is what happens to the luminosity of a star if you change the gravitational constant, Ooh. okay? It's a calculation we do, all right? So you, what you do is you, you, you put a little parameter there and see what happens to that parameter as you run through the calculations for a star's luminosity. And what you find is that the luminosity of a star is extremely sensitive 
to the value of Newton's gravitational constant, mm. to the seventh power. Wow. Okay? So, so what's interesting about that is if the gravitational constant were different, slightly higher earlier in the universe than today, uh, as, as, as Brian can attest, there are whole branches of, of physics that think about and wonder and worry about whether the constants have actually been constant. All right? Mm. But forget whether we, can, we have godlike powers to just change it and see what happens. Were they always this good? Did they change over time? Mm. So you can look at what, how sensitive it is and constrain how much it could have possibly changed because you would see stars of enormous luminosities living out their lives very quickly in the early universe, and you don't see that. So mm -hmm. it's, to the, it's, it's to the seventh power of that term that the luminosity would be affected. And seventh power is, is that times that times that times that times that, okay, yeah. all, all through. So we actually find that number uh, in intro astrophysics graduate school. And can you define luminosity for me? It's not because if you're saying that it's it's not just brightness. It can't. Oh just yeah, yeah, be no, yeah. So here it is. Right. It's simple. If this 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 example is rapidly becoming obsolete. But take a hundred watt light bulb. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What is that? Right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. In the old days, there yeah. was like the. That's bulbs like that okay. Got now hot. here's what you do first. Uh, you <laughs> dial up your grandmother on a rotary phone. <laughs> <laughs> so. So the, the wattage is its luminosity. So no matter what distance I put it from you, it will always be a 100-watt bulb. Okay, gotcha. Right. As I get it farther away, it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, so that would be its brightness. Right. That's all. So that's it. So, okay. So you're saying that yeah. gravity is like a string on that, on that, uh, on the light itself, kind of like that would be making it less? No, no, it would be like a knob. Like a knob it, turning it down. the wattage. Thank you. Right. Yeah, yeah. So instead of pulling it back, it's turning down the watt. Okay, that's cool, man. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a dimmer. It's or, a dimmer. Or a thing on, right. on the bulb itself. Yeah. yeah. Let's yeah, make the universe is. sexy, baby. You know? <laughs> dim. <laughs> Let's dim the lights. Hey, you know. <laughs> How would you like a little cosmic champagne? <laughs> All right. Here's next. Time to go to the next time question. To That's how you next know. Question. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> you like the sexy universe, Brian? <laughs> yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to use some. I'm making notes. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Let's go to uh, Sandra Bayani. And Sandra says Is it possible that the laws of physics? change beyond our cosmic horizon so that all of our theories about multiverses stop working and stop making sense. Greetings, fellow Earthling. I cannot get enough of this show. Please, whatever you do, never stop this podcast. Oh, Chuck, did you just I, add that? No, I did. Okay. <laughs> I really didn't. <laughs> I mean, sometimes Actually, I love I, that question. Yeah, that's a wonderful. I, I question. love that question because it brings in our horizon and multiverses and the very theories hmm. that predict a multiverse work in our universe. Why should they work in another? We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we will get right to the heart of that question with our special guest today. He's a special guest to me, Brian Cox from over in the UK. We'll be right back. We're back. Star Talk Cosmic Queries. This is everything physics because I got one of my people here. One, one of my, one of my uh, science and education brethren, Brian Cox from over in the UK, who, uh, they call him a rock star over there, and we've said this on his previous appearances, but it's worth repeating that this man had a number one song on the pop charts in the UK. So you're a literal and figurative rock star of science. Am I, have I overstated that, Brian? I think no, I, I think I, you've understated it, if anything. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the name of the song again that you performed the, the most famous song is a song called things can only get better which you will say correctly is again runs a counter to the second law of thermodynamics and oh, right. yes. <laughs> so it's an inaccurate song but uh yeah uh, yeah sometimes you gotta break some eggs to make an omelet you know yeah. as they say all right so chuck we left off with a brilliant question about here we are in our universe that has our own horizon and we come up with our own theories of the universe. And one of them is that there might be a multiverse. So beyond our horizon, if it's not in our universe, why should we even believe that the rules that predict a multiverse would even exist? There you go. Yeah, I love that. There's yeah. a lot to unpick there. Um, so our horizon, first of all, that there is a, a limit to how far we can see, um, which is the, the fact that our universe is of a finite age, or let's say there's been 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang. 
and so there's a there's a finite distance you can see because light travels at a finite speed so we are very sure that there are galaxies way beyond our horizon but essentially the light has not had time to reach us from them and um, now actually as neil said in the last the answer to the last question um you can ask that you can say well observationally do we see any evidence of the laws of nature so the strength of gravity for example going back to the last question uh, changing as we look out to the most distant galaxies and the answer is no we have no evidence that they change in the patch of the universe we can see so that's the observational point um, but when you start to talk about the laws of nature in different regions of the universe or multiverse as you said then it becomes more interesting um, one multiverse there are lots of different kinds of multiverse but one of them is called the inflationary multiverse so we have a theory called eternal inflation which essentially leads to the idea that there are perhaps an infinite number of um, bubble universes of which ours is one and the piece that we can see the observational the, the, the little piece we can observe is a patch in one bubble universe amongst perhaps an infinite number of bubble universes in the inflationary multiverse. And those theories do lend themselves potentially to, to the laws of nature in each bubble possibly being different. And the way I sometimes picture it is like a snowstorm with snowflakes. So every snowflake is different. Um, because it's had a different formation history. Um, but there's something similar about them all, which goes to the underlying structure, which is to do with the water molecule itself. So there's something similar, there's an underlying framework, but every snowflake is different. And the, the inflationary multiverse can be like that. So you can imagine that the laws we see, things like the strength of gravity, sort of crystallize out as these bubble universes form from the, uh, the, the, the potential, which is the this thing called inflation that's potentially going on all the time. So, so it's possible that different universes have different um, emergent laws, things like the strength of gravity. And we, we, I think most physicists probably all expect that there'll be some kind of underlying framework which could something that we don't know what it is, right? Something like string theory or something which underlies the whole thing. Um, so that uh, maybe, maybe Neil wants to add, but that's the uh, my summary of the inflationary multiverse. I love your snowflake analogy, but suppose that uh, do you have enough latitude in your eternal inflation inflationary multiverse model to have a universe that has five pointed snowflakes instead of six? I mean, is, how much room do you have to just make stuff up <laughs> completely? We don't know. This goes back to, it links to something called the string landscape, which um, Leonard Susskind actually wrote a great book called The Cosmic Landscape a while ago, detailing this theory. So when you look at string Just theory, remind me, Leonard is, Susskind is the one who's a big exponent of the holographic universe. That's the yes, same guy. Yeah, yes. he's one of the, he, he's been at the cutting edge of, of physics for decades raising it mm. and then um, so the, in the string landscape the idea is that um the, in string theory it turns out you can have uh, there's a number that they calculate i don't know how they do it actually but it's something well i do know how they do it it's, it's something to do with all the extra dimensions being curled up and stuff it doesn't matter but essentially 10 to the power 500 different possibilities Ten, so one with 500 noughts after it these are the different ways that you can produce um, laws of physics like the ones we see from the underlying theory and that was seen as a really That's disappointing. That's a lot of wiggle room right there. Yeah. Well it was it, but, but, but the way I see it it's, it's almost like saying we understand DNA so in biology we have a theory we have these things A, C, D, T, T and G right the four different bases that come together to form DNA and it's like saying okay so there's an underlying theory it's pretty simple it, it's the, the double helix it's chemistry out of that it's like saying right predict a human being yeah you can't so of that. course you can't because there are many different combinations of dna and we have no understanding yet of which ones would work and which ones wouldn't and which ones can be realized by evolution and which ones can't you know it's just but it's an it's astronomical number of combinations of just to make humans let yeah, alone exactly. all forms of life so, right. so it's like saying we understand the basic chemistry that gives us that thing dna but then from that, predicting a particular instance of that, an organism, is of course it depends on its history, it depends on yeah. all sorts of things. And it's, it's the same. If you look at that like, um, I don't know, an alphabet to create a language, um, 
can you rule out the nonsense? For instance, if you know English, you know that uh, HLP PP5 is not a word. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right? So, well, like, yeah, so are you able drama. to kind of rule out the nonsense that, okay, these things would not happen. And so even though it is a possible combination, we know that it's kind of gibberish. How do we narrow that? Well, I mean, we, we don't. I mean, we don't know. We haven't got the expertise. We don't really know what the underlying theory is. Um, but I mean, for example, you could imagine a bubble universe that forms and gravity is so strong that it just collapses again in a millisecond. There may be many universes like that. So that might be, you know, as you say, that might be a universe that we consider was just never got going. So gibberish. it's undoubtedly That's true. That's a gibberish, gibberish universe. That would be a gibberish <laughs> universe. universe, maybe. So it might just about form and then collapse again, for every, example. Every, you'll, know, uh, you'll know if you meet a, a life form from there, because it's just like... <laughs> 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 and not only are the laws of physics gibberish, so is their language, exactly. right? That's what you're saying. <laughs> I, mean, I, just want to emphasize, I just want to emphasize, this is speculative stuff. So the string landscape, as I said, Leonard Susskind's book is great on this. Uh, and then the link, though, it's interesting that inflation, which Neil will know about as well, that's a theory that was introduced initially just to um, deal with something called the horizon problem. You mentioned the horizon. It's essentially the, the unexplained point that if you look out, look in one direction out into the universe as far as you can and then turn around and look in the other direction then you're looking at points that emitted light that we're receiving now that now in the universe is something like 93 billion i think it is light years away right because of the expansion of the universe so you're looking at points that in the standard model of things could never have been in contact with each other and yet are at the same temperature to one part in a hundred thousand which is an observation. Interesting. So that means, uh, and inflation so just a quick initially... thing, Chuck, I think we did an explainer on this. Yeah. Uh, there was something where I was talking about uh, yeah, that the we, universe we... Has, a, has a more uniform temperature right. than different parts of the same room you're in. Right. Well, that's because right. we were, we, with that explainer, we were talking about redshifting is kind of how we got into it. Oh, that's how we got there. Because yeah. I was saying, you have an air conditioner in a corner, you have a heater over there, right. and you're fine if it's a five degree range in a room that's talking to itself thermodynamically. Yeah. And now we have across the whole freaking universe, and it's, when, uh, it's within a hundred thousandth of a degree, which yeah. is completely mind boggling freaky, and we needed a freaky explanation for it. Yeah, so inflation was the idea that once upon a time they were in contact. And then the universe expanded very, 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 very fast for a, for a probably a small amount of time, and um, and so and so we thought that they couldn't have been in contact with with each other, but in fact they were, and so that's why why inflation was introduced. But it ended up it ended up doing several things that it was not designed to do initially. One was that the thing that drives inflation, which has got a fancy name called inflation, oh, field, it's, but it doesn't it's, matter. Uh, it's it a breakdown in the supply chain. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah well, then, oh, it makes that look trivial. Right? Uh, uh, the two two points were doubling in this. If you take the two points in the universe, then they double. The distance between them doubled every ten to the minus thirty seven seconds in the the basic models of inflation. So it's much worse than we're going through now with prices. It's an incredible exponential <laughs> expansion. Um, but much worse is an understatement there. Just to be yeah, clear, yeah. But in looking at that. Um, uh, Stephen Hawking actually was involved in this, and many physicists in the 80s found that these We're just theories... saying, Chuck, Chuck, last time we did this, he said Stephen was involved I know, in this. Steve, yeah, he, <laughs> he's cleaning it up this time, Neil. He's clean. Yeah. He's, he's, he's like been Stephen a little better. I, I name drop. <laughs> we got to hear so, the last name here. Stephen, <laughs> Kit, Lenny, all yeah. those people. And this so, time. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that theory, it was discovered, predicted that there would be ripples in the density of particles in the universe through the Big Bang, as inflation drew to a close, which are the ripples that we see in the cosmic microwave background radiation, which you may have talked about, and also actually in the distribution of galaxies across the sky. So there's a distribution. They're not just completely random across the sky. There are patterns in the galactic distribution. And that was predicted before it was observed by this theory. So the theory is interesting and textbook, right? you'll find it in cosmology textbooks. But the eternal inflation bit, which is kind of an add-on to that, 
ends up with this idea that inflation doesn't stop everywhere at the same time, basically. So you get multiple bubble universes. And then that theory was noticed that that's a mechanism to realize the string landscape, which gives you the possibility of varying the laws of nature in each of those bubbles. So that was a history. So it's not just, it sounds fantastical, but it's not just like somebody just dreamt it up one day and right, said this right. would be I cool. try to make that There's clear because otherwise they think we're just pulling stuff out of our ass. And it's, yeah. it's, uh, even if it is out of our ass, it's very carefully withdrawn. <laughs> By the way, that's uh, that's yeah. one of the universes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With a central black hole. Yeah. <laughs> Time to go to the next question. Oh, no. Yeah, really, we, to we, to we need to question. move on now. Uh, okay. okay, here we go. <laughs> Hitty Wegmans uh, says this. Hello, Dr. Tyson, Dr. Cox, and Lord Nice. And I bet you can't pronounce my name correctly. I, I, you win that bet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Get no argument from me. Uh, I was and asked. His name is what? His name what, what's is. What's the name? H i d d e, w a a g e m a n s. I said Hitty Wegmans. Okay. Uh, and he's from the Netherlands, so he's Dutch. Oh, it's a oh Dutch that, name. that helps how to pronounce that. Yeah. yeah. So he de Wegmans, maybe he de Wegmans. OK. Wegmans. And it, yes, it's it, yeah, if it's Dutch, it's <laughs> um, he says, I'm asking myself <laughs> after I watch the movie, The Atom Project, if you really can time travel with wormholes, by the way. Oh, here we go. Uh, Chuck Hitty is pronounced hidden without the N. Who knew? There you Hitty. go. Hit it. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Right. Well, you got to read to the end so you can help you pronounce I, it. I, I, listen, People help is, you out there. That is too much work, Neil. <laughs> 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 All right, so, 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 Brian, we're talking about time travel and wormholes. Uh, I presume, we, I, I think everyone knows with Einstein relativity, you can travel into a future, all right, or at least into the future of where you once were. So let's confine this to can you go backwards in time? Do wormholes enable this at all? Wormholes are getting increasingly interesting, actually, um, particularly in the study of black holes. We can we can get onto that, but um, so yes, uh, wormholes are allowed geometries in Einstein's theory of general relativity. If you just take that theory alone, what do I mean by that? So it, they really are shortcuts through space and time. So you can imagine, you know, traveling from New York to Sydney, it takes a long time. You go around the surface of the Earth, or you could tunnel through, and you could get there quicker. So so yes, if wormholes exist and you could travel through them and they were big enough and stable enough then you can build a time machine and um, now virtually every physicist who works on this and kip thorne actually who got the nobel prize for gravitational waves did quite a lot of interesting work on this um it, it looks like and he was a main advisor in the movie interstellar he was, he was yeah. in fact an executive producer which and the robot hold. in that movie was named kip it was, and, oh, and it has a wormhole. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and he also actually suggested to Carl Sagan in Contact that wormholes were used in the film, in the movie Contact, in, and yeah. the book, story, and the novel the actually first. Uh -huh. So, um, so the, when you add quantum mechanics into the mix, which is the theory of everything else, because our universe hasn't just got gravity in it; it's got all sorts of other things in it as well. Obviously, atoms and electromagnetic radiation and so on. Then it seems like the wormholes are inherently unstable. The big ones. And if you try to travel through one, it collapses. So that's basic. I should say, by the way, that they're part of they're, they're such an integral part of Einstein's theory. It's a very famous paper in the 1930s by Einstein and Rosen, and they they were called Einstein Rosen bridges before they were wormholes. And they're they're built in to the basic description of a, of a black hole. If the black hole had lived uh, had lived forever, it's called the eternal the maximally extended Schwarzschild metric, right? Whatever it's called. But it was that which was discovered by Schwarzschild in 1916, just after the theory was published. Then there's a wormhole in there, right? So they're just fundamental to the theory. But most physicists believe, and Stephen Hawking wrote a paper actually called the Chronology Protection Conjecture conjecture oh. where he thought about this who knew he that, was a rapper they will be unstable <laughs> yeah chronology chrono I, I can even say it. you can say it. i can't say it chronology protection conjecture um but uh, that the, these things would not be stable and you can't travel through them so you can't build time machines however it's worth saying that wormholes are becoming very very fashionable now in what's called the er equals epr 
paradigm. So Einstein Rosen, ER is Einstein Rosen, this thing from the 1930s where Einstein and Rosen noticed that they these geometries exist in space time or can exist. EPR is Einstein Podolsky and Rosen, spooky action at a distance. It's quantum entanglement. And so what now is very fashionable and looks as it's one of the best explanations of how information gets out of a black hole is that this plays a role. So you can, there's a kind of a dual description. So we've got quantum entanglement, which is this spooky action at a distance thing where you separate things to large distances and they're still um, linked in some way. Um, the linked in some way is starting to look possibly like you can describe that in terms of wormholes, microscopic wormholes mm. linking them together. Mm -hmm. But this is really, this is stuff that's been done now, 2020, 2022. So it's, um, it's on the edge but people are taking it very okay, seriously. Okay, so wait, wait, let's let's pause there and come back. But all right, now you've established that we agree we can think about wormholes, but you haven't told us how to go backwards in time. When we come back, Brian Cox is going to tell you how to go back and not kill your parents, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you an even simpler way, if you really want to go backwards in time, get married and do something wrong, because she will <laughs> never let you forget. <laughs> forget. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck, for your marital, put, splitting your marital issues into this <laughs> podcast. Star Talk will return with Brian Cox. I'm going to find out how to go back in time. Be there. We're back. Star Talk, Cosmic Queries. Got Chuck, of course. Chuck, you're uh, tweeting at Chuck Nice Comic. Thank you, sir. All right, yes. You got some fun stuff there that tr tracks current events and things. Yeah. Uh, it's always good to see what you have to say about that. Try and that. Brian Cox, my friend and colleague from the UK, is... Uh, taking the United States by storm and a little bit of Canada in a multi dozens of cities. He's bringing his major theatrical production. Of, uh, do you give it, give it a title or is it just everything you want to know about where we are in the universe? How about that? I, Horizons. Horizons. There it is. Yeah. Boiled down that's, to... That's, and Billy Connell is over that way. No, which way? Okay. That way. There he is. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. And Brian Cox, you can find his schedule in Brian Cox live.co.uk uh, just do a google on brian cox live it'll send you there and you can see the whole schedule and he's coming through town with a hugely visually spectacular display cool and this is what you know this is what stages are for if the universe is the biggest stage of them all he's brought the universe onto into theaters so brian welcome to town for this wow. so we left off with uh describing wormholes and i have to tell the story just, I have, Brian, I have to tell this, okay? Uh, Chuck, so Brian, you just stay on the side while I tell this to Chuck. So Chuck, I'm in, the, I'm in London, and I'm a guest on Brian's show. Okay. And we're talking about space travel and space exploration. And, I, and he's got a whole audience there. They're all UK people, okay? And they're kind of, they're new to me, and I'm a little new to them, but they know Brian. But, and they know I'm American. So I talk about the future of space travel. And I say, maybe, you know, no, chemical rockets are not going to work. We, in order to do this, we need like warp drives or ideally wormholes. And then we can do this. And Brian kicks in and said, wormholes are unstable and they'll collapse and you can't do this. He's correct, but that's not the point. The point was <laughs> the audience, do you remember what the audience said? The audience said, that's why the Americans discover everything. <laughs> because yeah. they're so optimistic about everything. That's why they went to the moon and we're stuck here in London. And so you lost your audience on that comment, Brian. And <laughs> I true. had them from then on. That's really because they, they liked my American, uh, in, uh, some of it's just me, but then I realized a lot of it's just American enthusiasm, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? So, so Brian, <laughs> how do you use wormholes to actually travel backwards in time? Is that possible? Well, so, yeah, if, if, if they were stable or you could stabilize them in some way, then you could use them as time machines. Um, and uh, that's considered to be unlikely. Mm. Um, but it, it really is true to say that we, do, well, it's very true to say we don't have what's called a quantum theory of gravity. So we don't really, in any sense, understand the, the deep merger between relativity and quantum mechanics, which you need to understand to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, and many physicists point out that we don't, you know, it, it feels like it's no way to build a universe. We've all seen Back to the Future. We all know the paradoxes that happen if, you, if time travel is a reality. So, so I think if you pushed most physicists and said, don't be formal about it and don't say what I just said, which is we don't understand quantum gravity yet, um, it, then most physicists would say, okay, we think the laws of nature will be such that there aren't stable 
macroscopic big wormholes. Um, that's what I think most physicists would say. Um, but Kip, actually, you mentioned interstellar, um, and Kip Thorne, who's one of the world experts on this, does point out that you can get around this. So you could have a universe uh, which permitted time travel and was not full of contradictions if there were no free will at all. So the whole universe itself is completely consistent and the time travel is built into the consistency. So that's a, and that's actually what you see in Interstellar. So that, that happens in the plot of Interstellar. He can't stop it. I'm not spoilers, you know, but he can't stop himself leaving his daughter's room in the past. Uh, and by the way, that's, that's also what happened in the story Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut, which is mm -hmm. a time travel story on top of being a World War II story. But his, as, and I, I think Kurt Vonnegut got it right. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian. He just described your life is always there. You're always being born. You're always dying. You're always in school. You're always in love. And you just rejoin where you were on that timeline and relive that. There's a Stephen Hawking's birthday party. No, it's Kip Thorne's birthday party. There's a proceedings. So, so Neil and I, when we go to scientific conferences, you have a proceedings. It's a big thing. And there's a proceedings for one. I think it's Kip. I think it's his 60th birthday party and S Stephen Hawking gave a, a talk and it's written up in the proceedings of his birthday party because he's so eminent and, it, and Stephen said um, said that Kip has become increasingly interested in time travel through wormholes as he's got older <laughs> that's how he started <laughs> that's how he started oh, oh, the <laughs> which I love right. <laughs> that's, very... that's good uh, that's good that's good I, I Chuck, well, this is our third of three segments. Uh, give me, give me a few. See if you can slip in a few more questions. All right, here. here we go. This is Catherine Cellarini Moore, who says, "Dr. Tyson, Dr. Cox, Lord Nice, hoping that you can hear Dr. Cox elaborate on he alluded to in his YouTube video regarding time and space not being the stuff." from which everything else is derived. Rather, that time and space may be derivative of something much bigger, much Ooh, deeper. Or deeper, deeper. This comes from <laughs> the uh, the study of black holes um, primarily. And the, the I would say it looks like space and time emerge from quantum entanglement. So we mentioned entanglement um, before. I should say what it is, by the way. Should I say what it is? Should I give the one minute introduction to entanglement? Sure, sure, sure. So, um, so, Imagine you have a, a coin and you can toss it and it can come up heads and tails. Um, if it was a quantum coin and there's two of them, they can be in what we call a state such that you could separate these coins out across the Milky Way to the edges of the universe. And you just look at one of them and you could toss it and it would be heads and tails. Well, you can look at it and it's heads, you look at it again, it's tails. 50% of the time looks completely normal. But actually, if you got back together after doing lots of experiments on this thing, you would find that the coins never came up heads at the same time or tails at the same time. They are always heads, tails, plus tails, heads. Or heads, tails, or tails, heads, right? They're, they're always opposite. So you can build a quantum state like that. That's called entanglement. So it's an interesting thing. It's kind of, um, it's like the information, all the information contained in this system of two coins is somehow spread between them and they don't behave as individual entities, even if you separate them to vast distances. So that's entanglement. Because they're not just coins, they're also waves. And the waves know about each other outside of the local place where Ooh, the coins no. are getting flipped. No, it's... it's if um, that's the truth, then I've been saying it wrong all these years. No, you know? no, they, they, um, they really, they are... The best way to consider it is it's a, it's a single system. And the, the information, the structure of the system is, is a property of the whole thing. Why isn't that the, the wave function? That's the best way to think about it. That's got to be the wave function. Oh, it is the wave, yeah. So, so oh, that's, what write, that's what the, I'm the trying wave, to say. Okay. The wave function, you'd write it down. You, it'd, it'd be a heads, tails, plus tails, heads is okay. an example of a wave function. And mm -hmm. for, the, for the geeks there, we can have a one over root two there in front of each one if we want. Equal mm. You've gone too far, but Brian. It, the key point is it's... it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's this, you had me at wave, you lost me at one over root, whatever. Well, 50%. <laughs> it, it, it equals, so, so you can have lots of different... Anyway, so that's an entangled system. And but wait, it, deep in there is that the, the, the there is a term that's squared in the wave function. So he's got to put the square root of two so that when you square that, it becomes a half. 
Yeah, if I want okay. 50 50. Then, yeah, he, he, um, that was a yeah. missing piece of what he was saying there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's the right. amplitude, right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so that's entanglement. It's, it's a fundamentally quantum mechanical thing, and it's very well understood, and we use it in technology and quantum cryptography and so on. So, it's a thing. It, it, this is how the universe works. And it does seem as if, um, as I mentioned before, the idea that you can also interpret that as having wormholes connecting these things I love together. It. I love it. Essentially, what you're seeing is that entanglement and space are intimately related. Um, that's the, the modern way of looking at this, the very modern way. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say that most physicists would say that the entanglement is the fundamental thing. And so we're, we're beginning to think now that you have a theory of quantum mechanics, quantum field theories um, on some surface or something, and then the entanglement actually it produces the space. I mean, it's true to say that entanglement, I've seen it said, which is a beautiful thing to say, that entanglement is sort of the glue that keeps space together. And so entanglement is, seems is fundamentally related to space. And therefore time but it's more more obscure. So that's the next uh, sci-fi frontier because uh, the latest uh, Doctor Strange is uh, madness through the multiverse or something. So they got the multiverse in there and he's opening up portals which are basically wormholes as he you know, jiggles his hand. So now we got to somehow get down into the very fabric of the space and time itself. That would be good. All right. Cool. Chuck, we got just a couple more. See if we can go into like uh, lightning mode. Okay, lightning if we here. can. Okay, go. Uh, well, let's lighten things up here with uh, Lindahl Fries, who says, uh, Dr. Tyson, Dr. Ty Dr. Cox, uh, Chuck, here is, uh, is there a parameter edge of the universe? And where in relation to that edge is the Earth or the Milky Way located? Are we closer or farther to the center of the universe? Also, how do we know the universe is expanding? And is it just that our instruments are getting stronger much okay love. so we need that in a sound bite <laughs> i can do it so so no we're, we're not at the center of the universe we're at the center of the observable universe because that's just a piece that we can see right but um the universe extends way beyond that horizon and uh so it could be infinite in extent but we don't know so um but it's much bigger i think than the piece we can see so no we're not at the center of the universe it might be an infinite universe. Um, we know it's expanding just very simply because we look at light from distant objects and that light is stretched. And the 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 uh, the explanation is that you've, light is a wave and it's traveling through expanding space. And so it gets stretched as it journeys. And what the, the, the basic observation all the way back to Hubble is that the further away- Hubble, the person, see, the, the, the person. Edwin right. Hubble. Yeah, yes, yeah. All the way back to Edwin Hubble. The, the, the further away the thing is, the more the light is stretched when it reaches us. And that's what you would expect if space were expanding um, essentially at a uniform rate. It's actually changing a bit. It's expanding a bit faster now. Uh -oh. Okay, um, so, so there is no, so if we went, if we said, I want to go to my horizon, let's, uh, Chuck, let's leave tomorrow. Yes. So then what would we see? We, you'd see the same universe as far as we know. So you could go to the horizon um, and uh, look around and you'd see a, a completely uniform universe with the same kind of distribution of galaxies. So, so like a ship so at sea, it's carrying its horizon with it, right. with it, basically. Yeah. So yes, that's yeah. a good example. If you go to the horizon on, on your boat and go to mm -hmm. the horizon 20 miles away, whatever it is, right. um, and then I, I probably got that number wrong, and now all the flat earth people will go, see, you didn't know. Ah, because ah, ah, so there is a horizon, whatever it is. It's way closer <laughs> than 20 miles unless you're in a crow's nest. Is, OK, right. Yeah, it's, it's yep. just a, so, um, yeah. So you go to the horizon and you just see ocean right. and you go to the next horizon, you just see ocean. And that's what the universe is like as far as we can tell. Yeah. I mean, that's as simple as going to the top of a hill. You experience that any time like you're driving up a hill or on a bike. You look at the top of the hill and it just looks like that's the end. You get at the top of the hill and it's just more of the same. It's just more, it's more, just, more. Yeah, like this time mm -hmm. you're looking down. More of the same. That's cool. Yeah. All right. All right. Let, let's go to Alain Bredot, who says. This might be the last question we have time okay. for. Okay, go. Alain says this, hey, Neil, Chuck, and Professor Cox, uh, um, we have electron microscopes to probe smaller stuff than with regular light microscopes. Do you think somebody is going to come up with a quark microscope or something of that nature Ooh. that will enable us to see even smaller or get closer to those strings Ooh, I that theorists cool. fantasize I about. I love it. Wow, it's an old, Alain. Ultra cool. That was wait, wait, wait. ultra Let cool me just set session. that up just real quick. So regular microscopes use visible light 
Right. And visible light has certain wavelengths. So if you really think about it, a visible light telescope can't see anything smaller than the wavelength of light you're using <laughs> because the light would just wash over it and wouldn't be able to bring it into focus. So electron microscopes use basically, I think, Brian, is it X-rays? Because electrons and X-rays are the same thing at certain, you can, you can beam electrons to have an energy level of that of an X-ray, and X-rays have really small wavelengths. Yeah. So now you can see detail way smaller than visible light. So this questioner knows this about That's electron really cool. microscopes it's and wants to take question. another step. So and there's a really great fundamental point to make here, which goes to black hole physics actually again, is that um, so as you make, um, if, you, if you take the wavelength down, quantum mechanics allows you to think of um, light as a wave or as a stream of particles called photons. And if you shrink the wavelength, the energy of the photon goes up. So that's just basic quantum mechanics. So the smaller the wavelength, the higher the energy. So you get to a point where if you want to probe smaller and smaller distances, what actually happens is you make a black hole because you put so much energy into the small piece of space that a black what? hole forms. And then as you put more energy in, the black hole grows. And so, um, so you end up reversing that process because, of, because as the black hole grows, then you, you, you get less and less resolution again. <laughs> so there's a limit um, wait, 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 to wait, how wait, wait. small you can see. So I'll step in here because Chuck didn't. You kept talking after you said, yeah, first you make the black hole and then you continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, so you can keep, you put more and more energy in. I'm saying this so, sounds dangerous, <laughs> Brian. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's an in principle argument. Oh, in principle. Oh, that. it's a but, thought experiment. But, okay. The, the point is that you get to a point where if you try to cram more and more energy into a smaller and smaller amount of space, which you have to do to see the small thing. You have to get more energy in, right? The smaller wavelength. Because you're using then photons you, that are higher and higher or, energy. Or, or anything, yes, or, or anything, electrons or whatever it is. Yeah. Then, then you form. There comes a point where you form a black hole in that region. And then you can't see and anything you, because your microscope yeah. got sucked into it. <laughs> because well, no, you're dead. <laughs> you did. <laughs> you, 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 you'll, you'll have less resolution. So, 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 so it's called it. Now, Leonard Susskind writes about it. Wait, so ignoring the complication that you'd be UV, dead. And, wait, ignoring the complication that you'd be dead and you've destroyed the Earth, you'd have less resolution on your microscope. No, you wouldn't yeah. because it'd be a tiny, mine, tiny black hole. Tiny. So it wouldn't, you wouldn't notice it, yeah. except you'd stop seeing so you can't probe smaller and smaller distances forever. I think Susskind calls it the UVIR connection, ultraviolet infrared connection. I think that's what he calls it. Okay. So, um, but it, but it's a fundamental property of the universe. So black holes stop you from doing that, going to smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller distances. Those pesky black holes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and again, it's fundamental. It's 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 pointing to fundamental physics. So we mm -hmm. go all the way back to this idea of space and time and the link right, to quantum right. theory. Dude, we got to wrap it up there. Oh my gosh, did wow. we cover the universe here? Whoa. Brian, this has been a delight. Uh, how, uh, I know you're active on Twitter. Where, where else are you active? Because you're Prof Brian Cox on Twitter. Uh, Prof Brian where else Cox. are you? Yeah, I'm on Facebook as well. Um, but um, tw Twitter is my usual mode of, mode of communication. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> a, just a habit, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it's a habit. It's quick, but, and, quick and easy yeah. and, 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 and sharp. And so... Brian, always great to see you and hear from you, and we'll connect again. Chuck, love you, man. You. Love you too. Always. All right, Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. As always, keep looking up.